we're going to look at wired and wireless networks. I'm going to pause on this slide just so you can read through some interesting facts around Wi-Fi. So specification content, we need to look at wired connections and wireless connections, encryption, what IP addressing and MAC addressing are, as well as the standards that surround computing. The requirements wise, there's quite a few, so I'll pause and give you a chance to read through this rather than read through this myself. So, wired connections. When we talk about wired connections, we're talking about devices that will have a physical cable that will plug that device into another device. Now, this is um, one of the most sort of stable mechanisms for connecting networks together because they're far less uh, susceptible to interference. So you don't get things like signal barriers or anything like that. They tend to be a far more stable connection. You don't tend to find out that you get much sort of uh, dropping in the connections as well because they're a fixed or permanent connection. And there's two main way type, two main ways in which we create wired connections. And the most common is uh, Ethernet cables, which are our twisted copper pairs, which you spoke about in a previous lesson. Now, the quick, twisted copper pairs, these are cheap. These provide uh, reasonably sort of uh, quick transfer speeds for sort of most home or office networks. Um, and they kind of serve their purpose in sort of current climate. The alternative is looking at fiber optic connections. Now, fiber optic connections are significantly faster, as we previously mentioned, and more suited when we're connecting sort of networks together. So when we're connecting multiple LANs, where the data throughput needs to be much greater, that's where fiber optic is most appropriate. It's, it's not the current sort of situation where we would have a fiber optic connection from our PC sat on our desk in, in an office, or at home directly to our router. Now, there may come a time in the future where this is the case, but at the moment, the transfer speeds are really not needed. When people talk about fiber optic broadband, we're talking about there, there's fiber optic uh, broadband in the connections up to their um, local sort of telephone exchange. And it could be that it might be up to as far as if you've seen those green boxes on the streets, that's where your internet connection comes from. And then from that runs a copper cable um, and it's a case, obviously, that networks may well use a combination of fiber optic and Ethernet cables or co twisted copper pairs. Wireless connections. So the main one is Wi-Fi. We've probably all heard of Wi-Fi before. Now, Wi-Fi is kind of a common misconception that Wi-Fi stands for something. And it's actually just a name that's given to the method of communication of uh, using radio waves to transmit Internet signals. Again, when we're using Wi-Fi, our devices need to have a network card that's capable of um, picking up Wi-Fi signals, but equally, we need something to transmit that. Now, in most cases, you'll have either uh, Wi-Fi um, access points built into your router, or it may well be you have a standalone piece of hardware that actually picks this up. And then Bluetooth is another alternative. And Bluetooth, as we probably most commonly uh, use it for, is things like headphones, Bluetooth mice. You can connect two phones together and transfer data. It's not the quickest, not... Um, and it's got a very short range, but it's appropriate as a wireless connection for connecting devices together in a, in a network. I'll pause on this slide. This gives you some advantages and disadvantages of each. So Ethernet, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Let's talk about addressing on a network. So one of the things to consider is obviously when we connect multiple devices to a network, we need a way to be able to identify which device it is that we want to send data to. And just like your uh, house or home that you live in, will have a postal address where you've got, for example, a house number and a postcode and so forth to identify it from your next door neighbor's house. Computers have the same thing. They have an addressing mechanism to make sure that it's a case that the right data ends up at the right device. And there's two ways this happens. We have our IP address and our MAC address. Our IP address, that stands for Internet Protocol, is a series of numbers that is assigned to a computer when it connects to a network. And this assignment of this IP address happens when the computer first connects to the network. It's given an IP address, a bit like a phone number you can think of it like, where all of the data is able to be routed to that IP address. And this is something that will happen on your home networks, whether it be your school networks, whether it be using 4G, 5G, whatever. All of these methods will have IP addresses assigned to them. Now, one of the crucial things with an IP address is that it can change. What we mean by it can change is that if you were to take a mobile computing device, such as a laptop or a phone or something like that, and connect it to the school's Wi-Fi, you would find that it would be assigned an IP address that then if you took that device home, would be a case that you would then be able to take it home, connect it to your network at home, and you'd be assigned a different IP address to what you would have at school. 
Now there are two standards within IP addresses. We've got IP version four and IP version six. And this is because um, over the course of time, IP version four, uh, we've kind of reached the limit as to how many IP addresses that we can have. And we'll talk more about that shortly. So IP version four is written in floor, four blocks of deanery numbers. So you can see an example here of 192.168.10, which is commonly the default IP address of your router on your home network. And each of those four blocks of numbers can span from the zero being the lowest up to 255. So it gives us 256 possible sort of um, numbers within each of those four sections. Now this allows us to have up to 4 billion different addresses the, within IP version four, which is great. Other than the fact that there are way more than 4 billion internet enabled devices connected um, and therefore we need to have an alternative numbering system as we've sort of exceeded the amount of devices that IP version 4 allows us to have. And this is where the new version of IP version 6 comes in. Now IP version 6 uses eight blocks of four hexadecimal digits and you can see an example of what IP6 looks like uh, just here. It starts 616, that line there. Now you can see that there's a massive of combinations that we can have. Now this gives us 3.4 uh, times 10 to the power of 38 uh, number of unique addresses, which means that we're very unlikely to run out of IP addresses anywhere in the near future. MAC addresses are slightly different. So an IP address is where the computer is connected to the network, whereas the MAC address, the media access control, is actually a 12 digit hexadecimal value that is assigned to the network card for that device. So you have the physical um, device in itself has an address code. So your IP address is where it's connected, where that computer might be connected and will change from location to location, whereas your MAC address is fixed. So your MAC address will always stay the same. So if you took, for example, a laptop and you connected it to school, your IP address may be one thing, your MAC address may be another. When you take that same laptop and connect it to your home network, your IP address will have changed, but your MAC address will stay the same because your MAC address, as we mentioned, is uh, embedded into the network interface card. So it doesn't change. And they're always completely unique as well. So every network card has a unique um, identifier. And these can, both can be used for routing data. So we mentioned in a previous lesson where switches, for example, will use your MAC address to distribute data, whereas routers will use IP addresses. And that's because your router, if you remember, connects networks together and therefore uses IP address, whereas switches connect devices and therefore will use the MAC address. Standards. Standards are around agreed sort of, um, let's say, agreed expectations that kind of every manufacturer sort of subscribes to. And what we mean by that is the fact that if you think about things like a USB port where you plug in a memory stick, that's a standard across all computing devices where they all have the same type of USB port. And it might be that you've got a USB-C or a USB-B, but nonetheless, those will be the same, whether it be an Apple product, whether it be a Dell, whether it be an Acer, whether it be an Asus, whatever, these will be the same type of port where you can plug in the same memory stick into all of the devices. And there are plenty of examples of this, things such as Ethernet. So if you look at most network enabled devices that have an Ethernet port, they'll all accept what's called an RJ45 connector, which is the type of connection that plugs into an Ethernet port. Bluetooth, again, all devices will use the same Bluetooth standard so that they can talk and communicate with each other. Wi-Fi is another example. Lots and lots of different manufacturers will produce Wi-Fi products and they need to be able to communicate with each other. Website addresses, okay? So if you think about bbc.co.uk, um, denbyhigh.co.uk, any of these sorts of things will follow the same sort of structure and format. And there's loads more of these that exist. But they're just agreed sort of um, ways of working to enable everything to work together. Encryption then. So encryption is ultimately the idea of encoding or uh, scrambling our data to make it uh, make no sense should someone view it. Now encryption isn't about stopping someone from being able to read your data because ultimately if someone intercepts your data, they'll still be able to read it. It just won't make sense to them. So it's not a case necessarily that it hides, it does hide the data as such, but it doesn't make it impossible to read. So the fact that that data is still transferring around networks, it just means that it's scrambled up into a secret code called ciphertext that no one is else is able to read without having the right key. An example of when this happens is when you're using websites such as banking or shopping where you might transfer sort of personal or private details that you don't want to be publicly seen. And you may notice that these websites use HTTPS and we'll talk about that in a future lesson. And you may see a padlock on the website as well, which helps to highlight that the data that's moving between your device and that website at the given time is encrypted. 
And there's a little image in the bottom right just to give you kind of a, a basic flow as to how that works. 